everybody, we're talking with a flight data recorder expert, uh, Dennis Semino, uh, was uh, employed by the United States Navy. Dennis, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, your experience? Well, I, I, I'm a millimeter wave radar expert from 1973 on forward. And I worked with countermeasures and, and uh, high-powered radars. I also am one of the, uh, the engineers that, that pioneered probably the most powerful Doppler radar in existence. Uh, that's used in Beijing, China for, for uh, weather detection. It can see 200 miles into heavy-duty uh, thunderstorms with a great deal of precision. Probably some technology I also used on aircraft, maybe? Well, to a, to a lesser extent, it didn't require the kind of coherence and, and the uh, hardware to put that kind of uh, weather detection capability in an airplane, which is very desirable. That's what the radar in the aircraft is. Yeah, sure. Uh, for commercial purposes anyway. And uh, tell us about uh, what your stint in the Navy. and. Well, I, I was uh, in the Navy for six and a half years, honorably discharged. I had nuclear weapons responsibilities when I was in the Navy uh, as a key holder, which is, uh, which is a fairly uh, rigorous amount of uh, confidence that the military has to have in a, in a person before they give them a, a weapons release authority and, uh, where you actually have a combination to a safe. So you were you were actually one of those guys who who uh, one of the two who would have had one of the keys for launch authority, correct? I would have had the combination to get the get to the key that, that would launch the weapon. I see. And this is on naval ships, naval That's vessels. Right. On, a, on a nuclear powered guided missile cruiser with nuclear weapons. On. W which uh, which vessel were you stationed on? On the USS Truxton. Truxton. Yes, N thirty five. I'm sorry. Uh, hull number was C Charlie. Golf, N as in Nancy. Which Reed. stands for nuclear, right? Yep, and she's she's been decommissioned since about 1996, I believe. Uh, they dismantled her and took her apart. I never thought I'd see the day that I would outlive that vessel, but but it was a fine ship, and I served under three captains on there. And wow. uh, after I got out, the Navy tried to bring me back in in, in 1981 as a, a a flight instructor at Pensacola, Florida, to teach naval aviators how to fly, and I went through the paperwork and then realized the reasons that I got out were, were still valid, so I didn't go back in, but I would have been a CW04. So I was pretty highly thought of and had a very distinguished military service background before I got out of the military. Right, right. And Tell then, us a little bit about the work that you've done in the past on flight data recorders, military, civilian, and so on. Okay, well, the flight data recorders that, uh, that I worked with were in a lab at uh, Smith's Aerospace in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, they're leading manufacturer of flight data recorders and flight management systems for commercial and military aircraft. And if you look at their history, uh, they were probably one of the first gyro makers for, for inertial platforms for everything from the space program back to the uh, Germany and Apollo missions all the way to the present day uh, Boeing 767, 787, and uh, the A300 Airbus. And if you look at any of the, the CDUs that are in most of the cockpits of a lot of airline pilots are flying. It's CDUs are the are the central display units for, for uh, flight management systems, and, and it's basically a monitor, correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. The flight management... Just for those out there out there that don't know what a CDU is. Yes, there's, there's typically about, on, on each commercial aircraft, there are two, two discrete flight management computers that handle right. uh, everything from navigation to fuel management and, and other flight per, uh, parameter controls on the aircraft notwithstanding your, your flight data recorders and cockpit voice recorder equipment. Right. And while I was at Smith, my fundamental purpose in life was to do the EMI and EMC certification for all the products that they built. And in addition to that, I worked extensively with the flight data recorders, inclusive of, of uh, certifying all the, the latest boxes that they built. And part of that, the duties that I had when I did that job was to take data from the flight data recorders' crash-protected memory and uh, take it out and analyze it and look to make sure that it was wholesome. In other words, when I'm exercising a box in a test environment, I want to make sure that that box is still functioning through everything I'm doing to it. Right, right, sure, okay. Part of the validation process is to take that data and look at it and make sure that it's real, as well as looking at bit statuses with the special test equipment that I had to, to query the boxes with. So uh, I had extensive exposure to that kind of test environment. Right, sure. Uh, well. Why don't you tell us what brought you to uh, Pilots for 9 truthorg and, and decided to uh, want to join up with us? Well, one of the things that, that uh, 
got me involved in it is to, you know, on the very first day that everything happened on September 11th, I was watching television in a test laboratory that I was working with at Lockheed Martin. And uh, when, when this took place, you know, we had limited television coverage, and I, I saw the uh, some of the the, uh, the video of, of the front of the Pentagon building and saw that there was virtually no wreckage outside the building whatsoever. And there were comments about a missile attack on the Pentagon, uh, which had been later verified by video clips that other uh, websites have had. So initially, right off the bat, you know, I questioned two things. First of all, being a uh, certificated pilot since uh, 1979, commercially certified since 1981, I, I wondered where the NORAD response was, because after all these years of flying airplanes myself, I personally have been intercepted once, not as a matter of a, a gross violation, but because I was transiting airspace, it was sensitive, so they sent up fighters to escort me through the airspace, which is fairly normal. Right. I was kind of, you know, wondering where those, where the aircraft were. It didn't right, make sure. any sense to me that these these uh, pilots were allowed to, to fly these airplanes, making gross deviations from, from their their assigned cruise altitudes and their, their flight clearances without any kind of a challenge from, from uh, NORAD. It right. Make any sense. That's what kind of got me in looking at this. And I was very, very concerned with the fact that as I dug in and got more information, I noticed that the you know the World Trade Centers collapsed on their own footprint, you know, in a free fall fashion. A lot of things that didn't make sense with that. But I was pre predominantly focused on the fact that what happened with Flight 77 at the Pentagon made no sense at all. That there was no engine penetration points on the building. The uh, the wing structures and vertical stabilizer and horizontal stabilizer probably would have left some debris outside the building, and they didn't leave any debris whatsoever. And there was a significant amount of wreckage that would have been present all over the lawn that didn't exist. Right. And uh, so that that's what started everything. But on day number one, the, the thing that got me more involved was the fact that I noticed that there's absolutely no nor NORAD res response of any kind, and that those aircraft were later to be found to have flown for nearly two hours in the uh, national airspace system without any kind of a challenge. Yeah, sure. And and as a matter of fact, Jason Baramus of the of the Loose Change crew has just come out. Uh, he was able to acquire uh, full NORAD tapes, and uh, believe they have them for available for download on uh, BitTorrent for those of you who want to listen to them. I, I I hope hopefully we'll get a chance to uh, download them in the near future and and, and analyze them myself. Uh, almost 120 hours worth of tapes. Uh, how do you feel about that, Dennis? Yeah, I'd like to listen to those and, and see what they sound like. I. I, you know, when I was in flight in, in uh, aircraft that I flown, I didn't have the ability to listen to the UHF communications, but for the most part, I heard everything that the controllers said to the military pilots, because they, they, they transmit on a, in a duplex fashion on two different frequencies, one on UHF for the military side, and the same exact uh, you know, verbiage is going out on a, on a VHF channel to the civilian right. aviators that are in the airspace. Right, sure. All right, well, uh, getting back to... Uh Flight 77. I guess. Uh, I guess you saw that we had. I uh, got a call coming in here. Oh, uh, you know what? That's that's uh, one of the aeronautical engineers. I got to get back to him. But anyway, um, uh, getting back to Flight 77, and and I guess you came across the the uh, flight data recorder research that we're doing, and uh, and that that uh, uh, interested you to email us and uh, start talking about it and wanting to join the organization. Yes, I uh, I was recommended to look at your uh, your uh, site from another 9/11 Truth uh, location that would, that had uh, pilots and, and uh, engineers uh, involved in it, which I'm currently uh, listed on. Mm -hmm. And uh, once the the, the uh, website master uh, and uh, the guy that set up that website recommended to get uh, into yours and, and look at it, I did. And of course, uh, subsequently got a chance to look at the Pandora's black box. And, uh, and spend uh, probably several hours looking at that and, and uh, taking a look at the, the pilot inputs and, and things that I was seeing on that. Hold on a second. I'm gonna, I am gonna. want to pause this. Yeah, sure. Okay, we can go ahead now. Okay, go ahead. So anyway, uh, once I went to your website, looked at the data, and then got steered to specific information, and I, I, uh, I started doing the analysis of it, you know, I was pretty concerned with the fact that uh, more and more information was coming out that, that was debunking the official story, and uh, Pandora's Black Box did a extremely wonderful job and, and a very uh, uh, unbiased job of, of uh, taking that uh, CSV file that, that was provided by the NTSB and looking 
point out, uh, you know, running it through a fine tooth comb and showing that that data didn't agree with with official witness uh, eyewitness accounts of what took place that day, and the later recreation by the uh, 9/11 Commission. And as I look deeper into that information and realize that the the terminal dive phase of the aircraft itself didn't make any sense, uh, as well as the uh, the resets that you that you pointed out for the uh, 29.92 issue coming out of flight level 180. Right, the altimeter. The altimeter reset uh, on one leg of the flight, and and uh, nothing happening on the other side of it. it right, with uh, with the animation versus the CSV file, sure. Yeah, that that kind of stunk. But the the thing that was the most telling uh, and and most damning aspect of what I saw in that was the the fact that all those light poles that were taken out at a moderately low altitude for a long duration of time prior to impact with the building would have reflected that the aircraft would have been in, in very, very stable flight for a very long time at extremely low altitude, hitting all kinds of obstructions, uh, probably ripping engines off of pylons in the process of, of the aircraft making it to the building. Yeah. And that didn't make any sense. Compared to the official NTSB data that showed the airplane essentially in a dive, which contradicts the, the light poles being taken out for such a long distance prior to the building. Right, and, and too high, as a matter of fact. And, and that gets me back to my point with, uh, that we spoke about before uh, regarding data loss with the flight data recorders. Uh, we spoke with Ed Santana at L3 Communications, the manufacturer of the, of the flight data recorder that was uh, supposedly in, uh, America, uh, in the 757, American 77. Uh, that says that uh, there could be no more than a, than a 0.5 second buffer lag between the time that uh, the uh, the measurement occur occurs uh, uh, basically from you know when when an altimeter shows a measurement until the time it's recorded on the crash uh, protected memory uh, that could be no more than 0.5 seconds is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And and the reason for that is that uh, at the very last you know portion of flight in a crash environment, there's a whole lot of data that would be lost if there was a greater lag than that half of a second. Right. In other words, you want to know, uh, you know, within reason, what took place in the, in the last microseconds of, of recordable flight data. Yeah, which makes sense. I mean, why build flight data recorders that could be missing several seconds from from uh, the crucial last moments of, of, of uh, whatever caused the uh, crash. <laughs> you know. It completely negates the whole purpose in having the device. A on flight data recorder, exactly. Now, one of the arguments out there from the so-called debunkers is that the, the flight data recorder first, they say, uh, initially they said it, 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 has a, it has up to two seconds missing, which is uh, one of the so-called uh, anonymous flight data recorder experts. Uh, on the uh, so-called debunker side, and uh, um, another uh, so-called debunker who's an old timer and uh, uh, basically uses ad homs as his uh, as his forte in <laughs> debate style. Uh, he he disagrees with even his uh, his flight data recorder expert, uh, uh, again an anonymous flight data recorder expert that says. Um, uh, he says there could be up to six seconds missing. Well, we're still waiting for them to give us a theory of uh, how the flight data recorder uh, had power terminated to the to the device up to six seconds prior to it hitting the Pentagon. Yeah, and that's, that's not that wouldn't be normal under under any circumstances because the flight data recorder would be powered from the the essential bus on the aircraft. Right. And under no circumstances would power be lost on that unless something catastrophic happened to the airplane. Now, if, and we've spoken to Ed Santana about this as well. Um, I, don't, I don't think I covered it with you, but if there was damage to the, to the crash protected unit, uh, memory module, That's right. uh, if there was damage to that to have data missing, it would be whole blocks of data. Is that correct? Absolutely, it would. Okay. It, would, it wouldn't just be. It wouldn't be just you know a few seconds missing. It would be a whole block of data, and that's, and that's why, um, that's why on some of the parameters they say are unconfirmed or not working. Correct. Yes, that, and that doesn't. That's not the, the assumption that the, that there would only be small uh, portions of the data missing is, is not a correct one. In other words, once the the way the memory modules would fail, the entire memory blocks are, are 
block addresses within the crash protective memory module would fail all at one time. Right. And, uh, and so that you'd lose a whole parameter, basically. Is that correct? Well, you, you, could, you would lose more than one parameter. You'd lose, you could potentially lose multiple parameters because some of the data is multiplexed as it's shipped into the memory module. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so you wouldn't you wouldn't just lose a few seconds at the end of data. No. Okay. That's no, right. and that's that's what that's what solid state flight data recorders basically prevented when they moved to solid state. Is that correct? Yeah, because uh, first off, the, the newer recorders, everything that was built from 1980 onwards, uh, their their internal power requirements for for processing and recording are moderately small compared to what the older boxes did in the past. Right, and and let me just interrupt real quick that this aircraft was built 1982. Um, so this this aircraft did, it, as everybody knows, did have a solid state flight data recorder. That's correct. But anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. What I, what I, I wanted to, I didn't want to go off on a on a long tangent here, but let let's go ahead and, and uh, pretend that we're we're the flight data recorder in the last second of its life on the, on the airplane, and the aircraft's impacting the building. Well, what's happening to the aircraft is the is the uh, aircraft accordions inwards from the from the. the Radome on the front of the aircraft, all the way back to the tail cone, where the where the flight data recorder and the crash uh, protected memory module are located. What's happening is the aircraft, you know, structural integrity is breached. The internal wiring of the aircraft, including the power bus, is being destroyed. And this this all takes time. In other words, this isn't instantaneously happening. This, the uh, if you look at the airspeed of the aircraft, which is 460 knots approximately. 530 miles an hour, something like that, right. on the impact. That equates to a specific amount of time from the time that, that the, the nose cone of the aircraft impacts the building to the time that the whole aircraft is destroyed. In that amount of time, the, the power is decaying on the box, irregardless of whether sensors are sending data because they don't exist. So the box itself is saying, okay, I'm not getting any data, which is fine because it doesn't, it has no rules that say, you know, I you know, a loss of data isn't, isn't valid. In other words, its job is just to take the, the data coming from the sensors and, re, you know, put it into buffers and ship it to the crash-protected memory. And that, that whole process takes no longer than how long? Well, it's, a, it's no more than a, a half a second delay from the time that the sensor data arrives at the box to the time that it actually becomes digital data that goes into the crash-protected memory. Right. So there's some small amount of processing time. In reality, that time window is even smaller uh, in, in real time. In other words, that, that, that specification number, that half of a second, is, is a maximum number. That's a right, minimum right. number. In other words, that's a maximum amount of time that can elapse before the data goes in there. But on a lot of the newer boxes, including boxes that existed all the way back to 1980, that time lag would have been significantly less than that half of a second. Right, yeah. And I, I, one of our other guys, Undertow, actually dug up... Um, uh, another crash scenario, I believe it was a 737, I'd have to go look it back up, but uh, it wasn't missing any more than uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 seconds of data. Now, one of the arguments is, well, there's so many other crashes out there that we're missing up to minutes of data before the aircraft crashed. And you know what they use for examples? TWA 800. <laughs> I mean, they're using, they're using examples of aircraft that suffered in-flight failure, uh, structural failure, uh, and exploded in flight. Well, of course, because of the flight data recorder uh, lost power at that time. That's right. It would have taken, you know, from the time that the aircraft disintegrated in flight to the time that the the, the, uh, the box went power off to where it couldn't do any any further work to the time that, that the aircraft continued to fall would have been the, the better part of a minute, probably, right. before, before the wreckage hit the ocean. Yeah, absolutely. It's completely legitimate, but the, the flight data recorder on that on that aircraft uh, did record a lot of things, including a pressure wave that existed outside the aircraft uh, just before the airport, airplane broke up. Yeah. So there's a lot of clues that happened in that in the last part of the flight, and the flight data recorder's job is to record in, until it has no more uh, power. And once the box loses validity, which is another matter altogether, then then it internally fails its own test and it, it'll probably cease to record, but that, that wouldn't normally happen in flight unless there are uh, onboard fire or, or, you know, something structural happened to the aircraft. Once again, probably a crash uh, scenario. Right, right. Now, let's, let's, uh, let's just drive this point home for even the average lay people out there um, that, uh, 
that aren't sure of exactly the technical aspects, aspects that we're, we're talking about. The flight data recorder cannot lose up to more than 0.5 seconds of data. Uh, the very last end data point uh, in the raw file shows a uh, radar altitude of 273 feet above the ground. Uh, that means that uh, it was too high to hit the light poles, too high to hit the Pentagon. Uh, if, it, if in fact, uh, it was 0.5 seconds from the Pentagon, because that's, that's the, the most amount of data, maximum as we've just discussed, that could be missing from the flight data recorder. So therefore, um, why did the data end at that point? If the aircraft was too high, you know, one of the other arguments is, if the aircraft was too high, uh, how, was the air, how was the flight data recorder found inside the Pentagon? Uh, how did the data just end at 273 midair? Well, you looked over the raw data file, uh, and you had said something about power resets. What did you find there? Well, what I found is that the, uh, the, the flight data recorder crash protected memory dumps that I was uh, analyzing from the NTSB reflected that the, the box reinitialized itself on a number of occasions, in, in some cases in, in moderately short uh, sequences. In other words, power was, was there, then a number of seconds later, power wasn't there, and then the box reinitialized itself and tried to get back on its feet and started to continue to record data, and then it lost power again. And this is a very highly unusual uh, situation for any flight data recorder to have. Where during and this, this you saw throughout the flight, is that correct? Yeah, there, there were no, no less than at least 35 of these instances in that file, which calls, calls into question the integrity of that data file in the first place right. and what it actually came from. My, my personal supposition, which I can't prove, is that that, that crash-protected memory dump came from a a bench test unit that never was on an aircraft, right? Because it wouldn't probably be allowed to fly in, in that kind of uh, condition for the if, if it had that kind of gross malfunction where it was losing power and reinitialized. Well, the pilots, oh. the and again, I don't mean to interrupt you, but the pilots, you, you, you lose power to the flight data recorder. I mean, we we've had flight data recorder failures in flight before. You get a ding up in the front. That's right. You know. Yeah, you get a notification on one of the CDUs, probably. On a lot and it'd also be reflected as a warning or, or a cast message, a, a crew alert system message, in the in the flight data recorder file itself. That's right, and, and uh, with the new avionics on board the aircraft, that you know, with data links and everything like that, that that uh, that warning actually is transmitted off the aircraft, so that maintenance personnel on the ground at some point in time will go, "Hey, we got to relock the flight data recorder on this airplane, and it's malfunctioning." out of there. It's so, a very important so, uh, As you know, we don't offer theory or, or point blame at this point in time, but in your pre professional opinion, it, it's, it's quite possible, it's highly likely that uh, this flight data recorder information was fabrica fabricated by government agencies. Is that what you're saying? Well, I, I'll, I'll go this far. I'll say that, that the data that I looked at, that, which was downloaded from the, from the NTSB, from where they offered the information up for analysis, in my professional opinion, that data is not real. Now, to take it even one step further, based on the, the, the massive number of power on resets and, and power interruptions throughout the whole entire data record, and the continual bootstrapping of the box coming up and, and uh, trying to get back on its feet to continue to record, that that would have been reflected in the CSV file that they recreated the flight data with. Right. And it's that not. was totally not there. In right. other words, these, it's like these two things were not even related. It's like an apple versus an orange. Right. If they would have taken that CSV file from, from that data that I was looking at, it would have been so glitchy that, that the recreation would have had all kinds of big jumps in it and it wouldn't have made any sense to anybody trying to make that into a recreation of the flight. Right. So that's my point, is that, that, that if that L3 file that was available for download and for analysis by anybody that wanted to look at it, if that was indeed real, which which I believe it was not, that data would have translated over into a really, really terrible translation in what the flight uh, uh, recreation would have been with completely, you know, fairly large blocks missing, you know, where the airplane was in this position and all of a sudden jumps to this other place with gross deviations in altitude and speed potentially because of the fact that, that there was such a huge time window in between that they wouldn't have connected up properly. Right. It wouldn't have been one smooth, contiguous record, which is what that CSV file reflects. Right. And, and 
the point, the, the, the main point to make here is that there weren't even any warnings as far as uh, what I recall. Uh, there weren't any um, in the warning parameters. Uh, there weren't any crew alerts um, as this, uh, in case anybody out there is thinking, well, you know, it was a defective box inside the actual aircraft. There weren't any crew alerts as to this box doing its uh, power resets, which it should have been giving crew alert. And the one thing I wanted to point out, which is, which is even more important, even though at the, at the speed the aircraft was allegedly traveling, the 460 knots in the, in the terminal phase. Yeah, that's what, uh, that's what I'm getting ready to speak to this aeronautical engineer about as well, but go ahead. But the, the main point I'd like to, to, to bring right now is we know for a fact that several light poles were struck as the aircraft approached the building. Well, that's well, reportedly <laughs> a fact. Well, we want, we, the next question would be is how the light poles came down, but let's, let's take it a stretch and let's say that the airplane took those down. Uh -huh. Those those moments of, 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 uh, of, of impact in some fashion or another would have been reflected in flight data recorder data recorded by the device right. where the device was destroyed on impact with the building. Right, right. And, and those anomalies, the impact points of those poles, though they would have been very, very closely spaced, would have uh, discerned themselves as spikes in, in probably uh, airspeed data uh, you know, because of the pressure wave, the impact on the, uh, on the aircraft wing versus, you know, it doesn't take a big uh, power uh, relative uh, uh, airspeed uh, indication deflection to be discerned on the record that the, the device will record. Right, true. Any, anything that's happening down low as the airplane is hitting things, if you look at flight data recorder uh, uh, recordings from airplanes that struck trees on final approach to airports before they impacted the ground, all these things are recorded on the flight data recorder. Uh, we're not talking cockpit voice recorder and cockpit area monitors. We're talking about flight data parameters reflect these impacts. Right, and I actually wrote up an article. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but when we first, last year I wrote it up, when we first received the, the, uh, the data, and I, I went in there to go look at all different parameters to see if there was any indication of impact with any of these poles, and all parameters from, from, from uh, engine parameters, oil pressure, oil temp, uh, 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 N1, N2, which is uh, basically RPM speed of the of the engines, uh, to uh, gens and AC volts, uh, uh, to bleed air duct, which should show an immediate spike. I, from what I understand, the bleed air ducts go through the leading edges of the wing. That's right. Uh, it, that should have shown an immediate spike, and all of them, every single parameter, uh, was operating normally uh, on the high end, but still within normal parameters. No uh, system indications of any impact of any kind uh, prior to the data uh, stopping at the I end. I think the most, the, pre the most prevalent indication, you know, based on the, the spacing of the engines on that aircraft plus the, the, the su supposed uh, wing in, in impact points with the poles themselves would have given a very pronounced spike in, in the pressure on the, uh, the EPR probes inside the engines themselves. Yeah, and you know, and, and as a matter of fact that we have a new video up on the forums of, uh, of a 750, talk about your V1 cuts, um, this, this, uh, this aircraft sucked the bird into the right engine uh, just as it was rotating. And the crew in ATC did just an excellent job of it. And you could see the puffs and the flames of smoke uh, coming out of the back of the, uh, of the engine. And uh, they went around, they landed the aircraft, but um, this was just a small bird. Now there's, uh, there's one claim out there uh, <laughs> from one of the, uh, the so-called Pentagon researchers that uh, says that you know, the, the right engine sucked in some of uh, leaves and, and, um, tr from the trees. Uh, on, at where pole number one was, because you can see kind of in the in in the pixelated picture that there's kind of a little bit of an outline of a of a semi semicircle at the top of the tree, but you, you can't tell, and and it's a it's a far leap of logic to even suggest that that the engine actually did that. But anyway, if the engine had ingested some some type of uh, leafy substance or or you know top of a tree or something like that, you certainly see it in the flight data recorder. That's right. What is you would have probably seen it in the EPR probes inside the engines, and potentially, uh, because of the, the way shock waves manifest themselves on impact, uh, you potentially would have seen this on the on the, uh, the the pitot-static system of the aircraft itself, or the airspeed. Yeah, TTO, PPO probes, and so on and so forth. And now there, as 
we know on, on that airplane they're up on the on the nose of the aircraft, but they're still relatively close to the impact point where the pressure shock wave was registered on those and, and been seen there. There's a momentary blip, and that would have been captured in the recording. So there's a, a lot of things that are kind of stinky. And uh, one last point I wanted to bring up, and and uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, is that you, you had told me on an earlier conversation that the the location of the flight data recorder uh, of this aircraft when it was ultimately found inside the building was was approximately the same location as the the uh, the pilot and first first officer's seat location. Yeah. Well. There's conflicting reports with that, and we have, a, again, a full article up on the forums at the top of the, uh, I believe it's in our Pentagon forum, uh, uh, where the damage analysis by uh, one of our guys, they did a wonderful job of the damage analysis, but it goes into where the flight data recorder was found. Uh, there's conflicting reports saying that it was found at the entrance hall and the exit hall. The flight data recorder, of course, was found uh, in the wee hours of the morning, Friday morning, September 14th, three days later, after um, after uh, September 11th, 2001. And it was found 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. It was found, uh, uh, one of the claims is it was found underneath the cockpit seat uh, where you know, we don't have any pictures of this cockpit seat. Why aren't there any pictures of the cockpit seat? Uh, and, you know, go ahead. What were you going to say? Con well, continue on that. I think his point is that, that uh, just basic laws of physics dictate that the the, uh, the likely location of the, the flight data recorder, because of its relative lack of mass uh, to the other parts of the aircraft that were much heavier, is that that flight data recorder would have been uh, not one of the first items in the, in the front of the aircraft that, that would have been found, because it's not in the front of the aircraft. It's mounted in the <laughs> cell phone section of the airplane itself. Yeah. And, and for that flight data recorder to be in, the, in such close proximity to components that were from the cockpit itself is almost absurd. Yeah. Yeah. The, the wow. density of the building it was reinforced. It had multiple layers. You know, we had you know the C, D, and E ring involved here, and, and wherever it was located, it, w it made no sense whatsoever. But that flight data recorder would have penetrated deep enough to be found in the same location as the components of the cockpit. So there's right. something going on there, but there's a whole lot of pieces of this puzzle that don't fit. And the more of the the more of the data that we get, uh, the better. But just to, to reiterate what I've what I've seen so far is that the, the integrity of that crash protected memory file that I looked at, uh, if, if it was real, which means uh, according to what the record looked like is it came from a box that was completely functional. Uh, in, in other words, there was nothing wrong with it, but power on resets were, were frequent and uh, and random throughout the whole entire data record. Yeah, That didn't make any sense. Let me just yeah. back up a little bit on, on uh, what you were saying about the the location of the flight data recorder. You know, it's not it's not unprecedented where, where flight data recorders have been planted before. Uh, the Air Canada crash up in... Uh, uh, the Air France Airbus crash up in, uh, I believe it was in Canada, uh, where you know they were trying to go around. Uh, it was one of the one of the uh, early flights. I believe it was a flight test and a demonstration test for for the new aircraft. I'd have to look it over again, but um, it was it was trying to do a low pass along the runway and then it hit the trees and exploded. Right. Do, do you yeah, remember, the, remember seeing that? Where the uh, the aircraft, you know, the pilot commanded uh, full power or uh, right. Toga power on the, on the uh, to try to go around and it didn't work because right. you said, oh, you're not going to do that. And from what I understand, this was a demonstration flight for the aircraft, and what they did is they swapped out the flight data recorders and planted a different one to make it look like pilot error when it was actually the fly-by-wire uh, error uh, <laughs> that caused that accident. And of course, since it was a demonstration flight, they didn't want that to go public because uh, I'm sure it would have had a, a, a big effect on their sales. Uh, but it's uh, that that aircraft had uh, it's well known that that flight data recorder was planted, so it's not unprecedented to have, especially in a secured location uh, after such a crash. It's not unprecedented to have a, a flight data recorder planted. No, and the, and the other thing too is a lot of people look at this from what you know what good would be served by people monkeying around with with uh, official uh, crime scene data. And, and let's go down this road for a bit. When I was on, on board the USS Truxton for, for uh, nearly five, five years of my life, we were involved in an incident where we nearly shot an airliner out of the sky off of Los Angeles. And the, the whole incident was completely covered up. In other words, our, the ship's missile, standard missile uh, with a live warhead, which was expected to take out a, a, a BQM-34A, uh, 
a drone actually impact or blew up because of a guidance beam uh, disruption, which was ordered by me because I was a sensor operator doing the targeting. This occurred six miles from an airliner full of people wow. going into Los Angeles International, and there is no record that that took place, but there are people from Missile Plot that were operating the fire control systems that can attest to this, and there's some ship's records. What year was this? This is about 1976. Wow. And it was, do you know what type aircraft it was? Well, it, I can tell you what type of, of radar it had on board that would narrow it down because I, I couldn't identify the airplane from, from my sensor. What was the radar? The, the radar was an AVQ-30 three, three extra. In other words, it's a weather radar that, that's used in a, a number of different... And that's uh, what it was homing? Uh, well, the radar itself is used for, for uh, weather avoidance. In the well, air. yeah, but I mean, uh, your, your weapon was homing on that radar? I, I was using uh, what's called ESM, or Electronic Support Measures, uh, passive targeting, which is a, a very sophisticated uh, ELIN system, or electronic intelligence gathering system, where I could I could measure uh, range and bearing, and, and uh, uh, I couldn't tell the altitude, but I, based on signal strength and the, and the bearing, I could tell the approximate range from the ship that, that I, I detected this, uh, this system on. And the, the thing that was supposed to take place is range clearance aircraft were supposed to keep the airplane, uh, which was coming in from Hawaii or from, from some place further west, into Los Angeles uh, airspace, supposed to keep us apprised of the fact that we had a an airplane coming through the transit corridor, so therefore we wouldn't we wouldn't uh, give a weapons free and uh, release a missile. But but what happened was the guys that were in the F four uh, range clearance aircraft were out there uh, chasing each other's tail and not paying attention. And uh, I was the, the sole sensor operator. In other words, the way the exercise went down is I was using ESM strictly as a targeting mechanism, and the BQM-34 had a simulated homer, or it's supposed to be a, a radar that would be carried in a Soviet threat missile. Mm -hmm. And I was targeting that, and, and then when I called missile plot and said, your, your target is on, on bearing 000 and approximate range of, of X, they went ahead and turned on the fire control system, immediately uh, locked onto the target, which is the BQM-34, and then fired the missile. Mm -hmm. Missile. Uh, now this is a passive. Act. Go ahead. This is a passive uh, homing system. Well, the, the what I was using was passive. In other words, I wasn't mm -hmm. transmitting any anything from my ship, and and this is the way you want to be in a in a war environment. Right. Sure. I mean to know that you're there. So we were simulating a situation where we had an inbound missile, and I was using my passive sensor to detect it to allow our fire control crew to lock on it with fire control radar, bringing it up quickly locking on and shooting it out of the sky, and what took place was once they released the missile, we're talking about a Mach 2 plus missile going towards the target, suddenly I picked up the AVQ-30 X-ray radar in the nose of God knows what airliner and gave them the data and said, kill the beam, kill the beam, the guys in missile plot sh shut the guidance beam off, and that detonated the warhead. The total distance on their radar scope, because now they had a, an active uh, lock on the target as well as the airliner, was six nautical miles wow. from the target wow. when our war had detonated. Uh, it <laughs> that I'm, sure, I'm sure the pilots made a report of that, and, and it, 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 it obviously uh, didn't hit the papers, that's for sure. Well, the thing was, this had to have happened during broad daylight. The pilots absolutely positively had to have seen the flash from the detonation of the warhead, and I'm sure they generated paperwork for right. it. And when you, when you extrapolate that over to what happened with Flight 800 off of the northeast coast of the United States of America, it's highly likely that they were that they had another situation exactly like that where they fired a missile, they inadvertently destroyed a, a commercial airliner, and based on all the data I've seen on that, you know, from a number of different sources that are out there, that whole entire episode is covered up much in the same way that the USS Truxton near near shoot down of a commercial airliner coming into LAX was. Yeah, uh, and you know, the outcome was different. It's it's it's. Uh, I'm sure it's not a, a big surprise to to uh, many that will be listening to this interview. Um, but our government uh, is complicit in cover-ups. I mean, uh, we have articles uh, from Washington Post on our site talking about deception at the Pentagon for September 11th, based on the King Commission, and uh, it's just uh, right down to the flight data recorder information that we have, where they. Uh, would have had to uh, uh, purposely and intentionally uh, remove or omit that altimeter setting during the descent in the animation to make the aircraft appear lower than it actually was. That's right. 
Well, here, here's what's happened. You know, the people in the NTSB that were doing this were were not aviation people. In other words, they, they were they were data handlers strictly. Right. You know, because if it would have been a, a, a professional pilot, they would have probably paid attention to and took care of it. Sure. You know, but the, the sneaky thing is that the, that on the uh, on the climb out and the and the uh, transition through flight level one eight zero, there was a there was a uh, a normal uh, changeover. You know what. With you know pushing the two nine point nine two button, right. so that that input went to the the uh, altimeter to to reset it, and that the mere fact that that that's there, uh, that's another piece of the puzzle that's kind of troubling in the sense that 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 part of it that it's intact, and then the, on the other side of this it's not. Right, so as compared and, to the CSV file. That's right. So which shows, by the way, the CSV file shows that the altimeter was set on the descent. Uh, through 180 on not only the captain side but also the FO side. Yeah. So <laughs> these these hijackers, these supposed terrorist hijackers, who can barely, who weren't allowed to rent a 172 because they couldn't control it, who probably had never been above flight level 180 in their lives, were able to set this altimeter not only on the captain side but on the on the right hand side in the CSV file. Yeah, simultaneously, so, right? Simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, so pretty good crew coordination for for a couple of Neil fights. Yeah, who couldn't control 172s? <laughs> yeah, there's there's a bunch of things that are wrong with this picture, and, and then the, I wanted to go to one more point that you brought out in your uh, in your video, and, and this is the, the, probably the most stinkiest part of the whole thing is that as as you saw, the, you know, the the airplane is bearing down on the Pentagon, and just you know within the last couple miles of, of the uh, of the descent to impact, it executes a, a long, long, wide turn. Like you said, exposing it to, to shoot down by any interceptors, which certainly would have been the case had NORAD actually been present that day. Sure, in Washington, I mean, class they lead, airspace. Nice leisure, swing, leisurely swing around, come back around to hit a precise part of the building. Now, that's pretty stinky in the sense that, it, that if this guy would have been a real hijacker, he wouldn't have cared what part of the building he was going to hit. Right. He would have hit what the first side that he that he saw. He wouldn't have taken any additional chances to to be shot down, he would have gone right straight into the building, and that would have been the end of it. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people say, one of the arguments out there, the reason for, for the 330 degree maneuver was because if he had started his descent at that time, he would have overshot. Well, we already demonstrated that that's not the case, even from that position, but however, uh, you know, beginning primary uh, students, uh, supposedly this kid had a commercial certificate, which, uh, which the FAA can't... Um, uh, won't comment on, but uh, uh, nor was he able to, to speak English, so I don't even know how he passed all his tests. But anyway, um, uh, you know, beginning in primary students, what are they taught? They're taught landmarks on how to navigate, and there's plenty of landmarks uh, at in Washington D.C. One being that uh, the Washington Monument. I could you could see that for miles. You could see it almost as soon as you blast off out of Dulles on a clear day. Actually, on the on, in the weather conditions that existed that day, which was severe clear, right. there's no doubt in my mind, because I've flown in that airspace myself, that, that anybody, even even somebody who was completely clueless, would have picked out the Pentagon from all the terrain clutter out there. It's unmistakable. It's a big, huge target. Yeah. And they would have had very little uh, problem seeing that from a great distance and bore sighting on it and, and proceeding on, such, on yeah, it. Yeah, on such a clear day. So there's there's no reason that a primary primary type pilot uh, <laughs> should be uh, coming up onto the Pentagon at, at such an altitude to, to have to do a 330 degree maneuver that the, the, the descent profile um, as far as even the most primary student uh, would have thought to you know uh, start his descent sooner uh, even though uh, he didn't start his descent sooner to, to uh, to basically uh, avoid doing that 330 degree maneuver, even though he didn't start the descent sooner, he could have still uh, had a gradual descent straight into the top of the roof, as I demonstrated in the film. The other from, thing from that really, his what you pointed out in the film, which made a lot of sense, if you look at the, the nature of the control input, inputs on the yoke itself, those are the type of control inputs that, are, that a, a, a pilot with a great deal of experience finessing the airplane would have done. In other words, somebody has been flying for a great deal of time that, that takes a great deal of, of pride in their precision would have been flying the yoke the way that aircraft yoke was flown in the terminal phase with, with it being uh, uh, you know finessed back and forth you know to the point where uh, you know it was being handled almost with robot type precision 
Yeah. Well, that's what a professional pilot does. Right. The neophyte wouldn't have probably been controlling the airplane with that kind of precision on the final terminal date, uh, dive of that flight. Yeah. That's another thing that's mm -hmm. quite stinky. But we have a, a mark on the ground that, that leads to the to almost the impact point that was uh, visible from from uh, Google Earth for, for approximately two days, I guess, prior to the impact. And that, that almost uh, completely parallels the, the final uh, light pole path to the, to the Pentagon exactly. Yeah, and one of the arguments against that is um, that it was a path worn out uh, by people who were walking on the grass uh, repeatedly um, uh, because it was a it was a common path that was used from I guess the heliport to one of the sidewalks or or whatever the case may be. But you know, I, there's so many excuses out there for so many different anomalies and conflicts. It's just mind-boggling uh, that the fact that people will actually make up excuses instead of questioning the government based on uh, the, uh, you know the information that we have that conflicts their own their their own uh, story their own theory. Um, I, I, I the best thing to do is uh, I guess what we're doing now is just keep keep pushing and uh, keep plugging away getting the getting the information out there blowing holes in the official story uh, for a government that's known for lies and deception. What I think do you we're think? We're making guys? a difference in the sense that we're forcing them to to try and. Uh, and and controvert what we're saying, and if we weren't really truly um, having a, a large impact on, on uh, the general public as a whole, they wouldn't be bothering with, with trying to debunk what we're telling, and, uh, and that, therefore we're becoming a threat to their lies. Yeah. And David Ray Griffin uh, and all these other people that are out there, you know, Professor Jones, all these folks out there with years and years of experience, in my case, I, I've been working as a, as a systems engineer now for going on 33 years with uh, a couple thousand hours of flight time, including some jet experience. Yeah, speaking of which, you know, this History Channel hit piece just came out not too long ago. Uh, why do you think they didn't contact you, Dennis? <laughs> yeah, well, I can see why they wouldn't contact me. Right. I'm not going to sing their tune. Right. I'm not, I'm not biased in, in one particular direction or another. I'm interested in finding out the truth, and based on the, the pattern of deception, clearly the public has not been given the truth, and we have, uh, there's a big uh, gap between what actually happened that day and, and what everybody's been told. Yeah. And until we get to the bottom of it, have a new investigation with real people investigating it, not people that are hacked or you know prior cover-up experts from other Warren Commission uh, lies that happened back in the 60s, we're not going to get the truth. And we have a government that was extremely motivated to, to create this, uh, this entire uh, scenario so that there would be a, an excuse to, you know, loot the treasury and take this nation to war under false pretenses and to enrich the, the military industrial complex yeah. and, you know I'm not a, a, a person that doesn't like capitalism but I have a problem with it when it costs Americans their lives right, sure, and other countries that were sovereign nations their lives so we need to get to the bottom of it we need to wake the American public up and the more truth we get out there the better but the biggest problem I have right now is that, that the, the stuff I have seen based on on analysis of Flight 77's alleged impact of the Pentagon doesn't make any sense. And until somebody can show me why all these things suddenly make sense, uh, I'm going to con continue to dig and, and get to the bottom of more of it. I'm mm -hmm. sure that more people will come forward, potentially uh, aviators that were in the airspace that day, that what they, they may have seen uh, and been eyewitness to as far as what took place and, and what air traffic control did. Uh, it would be nice to get more detailed information from uh, the, the lady air traffic controller that was involved in, in uh, Pandora's box, uh, the one that was working. Yeah, Daniel O'Brien. Yeah, and because at one point in time, I think she made a, a statement that she was quite clear based on the maneuvering of the aircraft and the, the way the aircraft moved, that it was, it was fairly clear that it was a military aircraft that she was observing and not a civilian aircraft. Yeah, I'd like to talk to her as well because her statement uh, also has conflicts with the with the flight data recorder and and if, in the fact that they said her and I believe the other gentleman's name, the air traffic controller, his name was Joe. Um, they said that you know this this aircraft was moving at very very high speed, um, where the flight data recorder doesn't really show that that high of a speed during that period of time. It shows you know 250, 300 knots. Uh, which, yeah, it's it's a hundred knots faster than what you'd see in in uh, Class Bravo, but 
It's not uncommon, that's for sure. Well, the, th the other thing that we... That they we said 500 about, miles per hour, I think, too. At this particular point in time, you and I both know that, that the experience level that these pilots had would have made it virtually impossible that they could they could do high-speed maneuvers of an aircraft of, the, of this size and its weight uh, at the speeds that they did without uh, having accelerated stalls happening and yeah, structural engine and, yeah, failures. Yeah. And they probably would have lost control of the airplane at some point in time before they even got to the target if they flew it the way that, that some of the records indicate that the aircraft was flown. Right. So, yeah. so well, on a final note, Dennis, uh, what do you think people should do out there as far as you being a flight data recorder expert, having tons of experience in, in flight data recorders, what do you think people should be doing with this type of information when they, when they come across it? Well, I, what I recommend people do is, is uh, not automatically believe everything that we say either. You know, we're, we're doing the best we can to tell the truth. I know that, that you're trying to tell the, the truth as best as you know it. And the, and the, I don't have any motivation to prove one point or the other. I'm just trying to get to the bottom of it. Right. I think that, that uh, the more people find out that the actual truth of what took place that day, however ugly it may be and how unpalatable it is, it's imperative that the American public find out the truth and do the research. I've got a whole, whole lot of uh, wishes about what I'd like people to do. I, I don't have a lot of hopes that they'll do it, but I think that, that the more and more people out there have become aware of the fact that, that they've been told things that are not true, that were blatant lies, and then they start doing research, uh, God forbid that we'll lose the use of the web through a declaration of martial law pretty soon, because uh, until such a time comes, there's a, a vast wealth of information out there, maybe even to the layperson that doesn't have the, you know, 30 years of experience working with uh, a wide range of systems uh, like I do, they can at least look at stuff that doesn't seem to make any sense and look at it a little bit harder and question the government's view that, you know, you know, move along, you know, there's nothing to see here, just trust us that we've told you everything, which is not really the truth. There's a, a whole lot of uh, stuff that can, that's yet to be discovered, and the more and more people like, like myself and yourself and other, other pilots that are involved and, and professionals from the air traffic controllers all the way down to some of the military people that were working inside the North American Air Defense System that day, as those people come forward and make their statements, which we can put on the website and, and make apparent to other people to read and available for everyone to look at and peruse. The more information we get out there, the better. And, the, and what we're doing is we're opening uh, the iris on a very small uh, camera aperture and making it bigger and bigger and, uh, and opening up the field of view. And, and that's what our job is, to get as much information as we can, disseminate as much as we can, and to debunk as many of the lies and blatant non-truths that they've told so far. And that's that's uh, that's my goal, and I'm sure that's yours. And yes, absolutely. You know, uh, some people out there they feel that since this uh, since this flight data recorder information may be fabricated, uh, not showing uh, really what happened at the Pentagon, that that uh, people feel that they should just ignore it, and not even pursue it. I mean, I've been told by uh, by some uh, one pilot in particular, he's not with our organization, but he's told us, you know, why are you wasting your time looking at this stuff? What do you have to say? It's not a, you know, what I would say to that gentleman is, is that uh, it's not a waste of time. And, and, and here's where I'm coming from. I, I served uh, in a highly distinguished fashion for six and a half years and probably would have continued had I not had a bad taste in my mouth from the, some of the incompetence I ran into when I was, when I was in the service with, with people that didn't take the job seriously, inclusive of the incident where we nearly took the airliner out of the sky. Uh, my problem is that I, I, as well as other members of my family, wore uniforms and went in harm's way, me during the Vietnam conflict, uh, and members of my family during World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And a lot of my relatives are dead on foreign soil trying to preserve the liberty that we're losing because of what happened on September 11th. And that's where the concern should be, is if these people are so quick to say, why are you pursuing it, then at some point in time they're going to have to accept the fact that all of their liberty will be gone all of their civil rights will be gone, they'll have no rights as a human being, and they'll be living in a de facto dictatorship with one person in charge of everything, and that's not what this country is supposed to be. And I refuse, and, and I'll fight it to the, to the last breath that I take, I refuse to give in to that. I will right. not buy it. Well, my, my, speci my, my specific point being that, you know, that they're saying that, 
we're wasting our time looking at this flight data recorder because it may be fake. Well, my my argument to that is, even if it's fake, it's as alarming as it being accurate because it came from the government and it doesn't support their own right. story. If they have, if there's, there's no reason for them to fake any information. In other words, if they were on the up and up and they were telling the truth, if they simply didn't have the data, they shouldn't provide it. You know, if the data did not exist, which is an impossibility based on the way these crash protected memory modules are constructed, it's impossible for a flight data recorder to be totally destroyed to the point where it can't be recovered unless it happened to be in the, in the very center of a nuclear detonation. Yeah, that, that brings me to another point. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up, and we'll wrap this up here in a few minutes. But, um, uh, you know, they couldn't find the, the black boxes up at uh, the, the flight data recorder or the, or the cockpit voice recorder up at the World Trade Center. What do you feel? How do you feel about that? It's not possible. Those crash protected memory modules would, would have survived the impacts of those buildings. Whether they were found in the building wreckage or, or on tops of roofs or whatever, in the adjacent vicinity around, the, around those buildings where the impacts took place, if those aircraft were so equipped with flight data recorders, those, those cockpit voice recorders and flight data recorder memory modules would have been recovered irregardless of the, of the rest of the equipment. But what about the collapse of the towers? Couldn't that have destroyed the, the, the black boxes? What about the what? What about the collapses of the towers? Would that have destroyed the, the black boxes? No, no, absolutely not. The, the box itself would be destroyed, but the crash-protected memory is, is inside of a, a very protected, uh, very hardened uh, uh, piece of, of steel that, uh, you know, we refer to it as a pig. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a very secure uh, type of environment that is, you know, by law, it has to withstand uh, temperatures of more than 1,150 degrees for more than 12 hours. 1,150 Celsius or? Centigrade, yes. Okay. So it has to, so it has to sit there in, in, a, in a fire, which equates to the approximately the highest temperature that, that uh, Jet A is going to achieve in a normal environment for, for half of a day and still be able to survive that and, and uh, produce readable data. And, and routinely these boxes are tested. I, could, I, I wish I still had pictures of the of the test environment that these these, these crash protected memory modules undergo during their certifications, and I've seen the, the the flame testing. I've witnessed it myself, and I can tell you for a fact that that that's not fake. That that actual test does take place. The impact testing takes place. All of these things that are done to flight data recorders are to ensure that the actual crash protected memory module will survive, irregardless of the rest of the flight data recorder's survival. I don't care if the rest of the box gets integrated. That crash protected memory pig comes out of the wreckage no matter what, or it's extremely blackened or, or whatever, it still is recoverable and, and, and moderately easy to find because it's a piece of metal that with, with notwithstanding a, a, an extreme, extreme high temperature fire, similar to the, the, the thermate type of fires that were found in the basement of the World Trade Center, which is unlikely locations for the crash protected memory, by the way, to be coincidentally in the basement. Yeah. Where those fires took place. Yeah, sure. Notwithstanding that, those would have been found and recovered and analyzed. And for the, the government to make that statement that they were not recovered, that on two different aircraft, these crash protected memory modules were completely disintegrated is not a possibility. It's not real. It can't happen. Yeah. And they even said they said that. Is it? it have you ever heard of a, a of a scenario uh, or an event in the past where the flight data recorder? Uh, module was recovered and usable, uh, but the cockpit voice recorder not, as as was uh, reported for the Pentagon. No, uh, not, I've looked at a lot of stuff, and you know, over the last ten years for sure, and I've never seen anything that indicates uh, that kind of scenario. I've seen where where there was damage that that uh, took place, and the you know the the module was recovered, the the, the component was recovered and and uh, and read, and there were some problems with it. But I've never seen cases where it completely didn't exist. Well, no, they did recover the the uh, the CVR module from the Pentagon, but they said it was completely unusable. Yeah, uh, that's that's not likely. In other words, that's an, that's another blatant lie. These these boxes are not your your typical you know recorder that you have underneath your television set or on top of it. Right. These sure. things undergo extreme, heavy duty, rigorous environmental testing to guarantee their survival. And yep, it's fairly possible that, that, let's say out of four aircraft that day, that we might have had potentially one 
unit that completely had a failure for whatever reason, you know, a random thing that happened to it uh, because of the environment it was exposed to post-crash, but it's not likely based on statistics, and, you know, just run the numbers on it. If you were to look at uh, laws of probabilities on a whole bunch of events, you and I would be much more likely to get hit by meteorites <laughs> as we sit in our chairs doing this interview uh, than these crash-protected memory modules being unusable after, you know, yeah. after all the testing we've undergone. Well, I don't know. September 11th is coming up, and it seems like September 11th is a, is a, is a day uh, where a lot of... Uh, a lot of strange things happen where they defy uh, physics and and so on and so forth. Yeah, we're so who knows? We could get hit by a meteorite in uh, this. Well, I'm kind of hoping that before we slide into dictatorship, that a meteorite gets me for sure. Because, <laughs> yeah, uh, that would be the, the easier way to go. I, I'm not I'm not a big boy for for going to to a death camp or something like that. Well, you know, they, you they are, don't, they, they, we're we're definitely going to be staying in the fight. We won't be going in any death camp soon. Anyway, Dennis Semino, thank you so much for uh, this interview. I, I appreciate it. Uh, stay on the line, and I'll be right with you. Thanks for listening, everybody.